Hey, John your Data Guy here, and welcome to our intro tutorial on TensorLayer, a deep learning library built on Google's TensorFlow. Now, TensorFlow is one of the best libraries out there for deep learning, but it's also a little complex. Most people jump into Keras usually to get into deep learning because it's simple. It's kind of like a bike on training wheels. And TensorFlow is your bike without your training wheels, your standard two wheeler. So TensorLayer is really cool because it acts as this in-between, between Keras and TensorFlow. So if you want to go from Keras and learn TensorFlow, you can use TensorLayer as an easy transition since the syntax is very similar. So in today's tutorial, we're going to learn how to start using TensorLayer by building a simple artificial neural network. All right, so let's get started. So the data we're going to be using today is the adult income census data which basically has information on various adults with classifications on whether or not they earn less than or equal to 50,000 or above 50,000. Now for the sake of this tutorial, since the focus is to build the artificial neural network, I am going to forego some of the feature engineering and feature selection and a bit of the EDA. Of course you should be doing these things, but again, for the focus of this tutorial, and just keep things a little simpler. We're just going to focus again on the artificial neural network and forgo a bit of the feature engineering and feature selection. Okay, so with that, we're going to look into first removing our categorical columns. So I'm going to use dot info here to see which of our columns are categorical and which are numeric. And we're going to build this function that we're going to reuse for our test data also. So we can very easily get the categorical columns without having to type them out. So again, you're going to initiate a list for getting these columns. And as you iterate through the data's columns itself, you're going to check if it's categorical and it's not the column that contains our classifications. And whichever column names fall into that category, we're going to append to our categorical columns list and then return the list. And doing so will allow us to very easily, after we go through this step here, to actually drop the column instead of manually typing out each one. Because again, we're going to use this for the test data. And we're going to use dot head just to make sure the columns we wanted to exclude were excluded. And now we have only the numeric columns along with our categorical column here, the salary, salary category. Okay, now we're going to do some simple feature engineering to our numeric data and our labels. So first things first, we're going to split our data into the input values and the output values. We're then going to initialize our label binarizer. This way we can transform the data so that the less than or equal 50k are represented by zeros and the greater than 50k are like, or sorry, represented by one. From there, we're going to visualize what the counts are of each of the outputs. And again, we have another imbalanced data set. So keep in mind the accuracy of this model is not going to be perfect because the data, again, is imbalanced. There's much more data values where this adults here are less than or equal 50k in terms of earnings. Well, that'll be for another video to handle that in balancing. From there we use a min-max scalar to trans fit and transform our input data because again the scales on which each of those columns are such as the age and hours per work they're on different scales. From there we just want to see what the shape of our data is so we know how to construct our neural network. So for here we have again six features for the input uh, one feature again for the output. To make things a little easier, I'm going to go ahead and use NumPy's flatten function so that we actually flatten the vector to a sing almost a single list or a single array. And now we're done with that, we can actually start building our classifier. So to start, we're going to set up our hyperparameters ahead of time. So for the learning rate, we're going to set that to 0 0.001. For the number of nodes in our hidden layers, we're going to set that to six since there's six features, but you're welcome to change this if you like. Number of outputs is going to be two because we have two outputs. We'll set a batch size of 300 and 500 epochs to start. And now TensorLayer has this convenient thing when you run the fit function on it, you can decide what the pr frequency is, so how often it'll print the certain epoch instances, so whether it's every five, every ten. I'm going to stick to every five since that's how the documentation did it. From there, we start putting in the pieces from TensorFlow, because again, TensorLayer is built on top of TensorFlow. So we're going to set the reset default graph from TensorFlow, in case we want to rerun and reconstruct this graph if we need to reuse it. 
placeholders for our inputs and outputs. Now again, placeholders, if you're not familiar, are kind of like variables in a typical math function, like the x or the y from like a linear function. So for x, our placeholder is going to be of shape none, comma six, which again means any number of row inputs with the six features that we require, because again, our input data has six features. And again, we're going to set that data type to float32, because we did feature scale it. And we're going to set a name for the placeholder, which again, you have to do for every piece of the network that you're going to use in TensorLayer. So the placeholders and the layers themselves, they should have names. Otherwise, things don't run efficiently. Same thing for the output placeholder. Again, this is going to be in 64 data type, since our only outputs are 0 and 1. Shape is going to be just none, because again, remember, we flattened our outputs prior and set the name. So next from here, we're going to have a session initialized as an interactive session. This is kind of how TensorLayer in their documentation chooses to do this. I think this is better because it models it more to Keras, especially in terms of transition. If you're familiar with TensorFlow, with TensorFlow, you can set things up to run the session where it's with such and such session as sesh, and then it'll close the session automatically if you do it that way. This way, we're going to have to manually close the session, but to keep things simple and show how this is related as far as syntax with Keras, I'm going to stick to this way. And I think this is also easier personally. We're then going to initialize our activation function, which will be a relu function throughout the layers. Excuse me. And then from there, we start building our network. Now, when you build a network in TensorLayer, you set each layer to the same variable for most of them. So if you notice here, for all the layers, they're all set to network. And the convenience of this is this is where it starts looking like Keras, where you start put, deciding what your layers are. So it's a convenient name for input layer. And then same thing for dense layer. Remember, Keras, if I remember correctly, has dense. So notice, for the first line, right, we set network equal to our input layer, putting X for our placeholder, and again, giving it a name. And now for the next line, we're going to set network equal to the dense layer, the first hidden layer, fully connected. And notice that we pass in the network, or again, the name of our prior layer. And that's how layers are in tensor layer are connected, pretty much by taking the name of the previous layer that you had and passing that in as an argument to the next layer. So for just to elaborate on this first in layer again, our inputs for the dense layer are the network, or again, the prior input layer. Number of units are the number of hidden nodes we decide on. Our activation function is the relu, which again, we predefined. And we set a name, h1, of course, for the first hidden layer. This again gets repeated for the next two layers same thing and then again we get to the output layer which again we set as a dense layer we pass to the network our number of units again changes because this is the output layer so we should only have the number of outputs too and now for the activation function we're using tf identity which pretty much brings back a tensor of the similar shape of what was inputted and we're doing this by the tensor layer docs convention because when we run the cost function softmax is automatically run in the background when the cost function is initiated. So following that convention, that's why TF identity is here. And when you actually um, run the code for each of these lines, each of these outputs comes up to show you the information on each of your layers. From there, we're going to set up the cost and metrics. So we set Y equal to the network outputs that you would get. The cost slash loss, you're setting up to be the cross entropy between the network outputs and your placeholder values. Now again, typically because this is a binary classification, you should technically use binary cross entropy instead, and it does have that option. But I wanted to design it this way so that it's related more to the documentation if you want when you want to follow that. And also in case you want to apply this to a classification problem that has more than two potential outputs or classifications. This way you don't have to recreate new code. Um, to get the correct predictions, we're going to use TF equal, which is going to return a Boolean tensor of the following. So we're going to do argmax on the outputs, which again returns the, the index of the most desired or most probable output against the placeholder. To get the accuracy, we're going to again use tensorflow's reduce mean to reduce the mean loss. And to do that, 
we're going to apply that to the correct predictions after they've been cast into their integer counterparts. And then from there, we're going to create like a y optimize placeholder using again the argmax function and applying softmax to the network outputs. Again, on an axis of one for both this this argmax here and for the argmax prior. From there, we're going to set up the optimizer, very similar that was done in TensorFlow. The only difference is that we're going to have these train parameters. So we're going to pull the parameters from the network, and this will be very useful for when we want to go over and save them. For the optimizer, we're going to use the op atom optimizer with the same learning weight that we predefined, and then setting the trainer optimizer to minimize, again, our cost, so minimize our cross entropy. And because we have training parameters, we're going to pass in the training parameters for the variable list. From there, just like TensorFlow, you're going to initialize the global variables. So again, initializing all the graph variables that we predefined prior, the placeholder, the networks, optimizer, etc. And now just like with Keras, there's a fit function. There's a lot of stuff you have to put into it, admittedly, but it may, that's what makes things a lot easier here. So you're inputting the session, the network, the parameters, the costs, the input and output, of course. Because we're using placeholders, we have to input the placeholders that we're using. The accuracy, of course, the number of epochs that we're going to run, and the print frequency, which we said before, how many times we want to see the printing come out. And we're going to set for now the option to evaluate the training to false. By default, it's true if you want to try that, but we'll set it to false for now. And once you do that, you would see the following show up, as you've probably seen already. It tells you at each epoch, again, in this case, every five, because we set the print frequency to five, how long it actually took to run the epoch and the loss that was computed at that step. And since we did 500, this would run 500 times. This does run for about a couple of minutes, at least on mine um, computer. It may take longer for yours, depending, or shorter. So we keep going through all that. And then we get our, again, similar thing to Keras, set our prediction function to actually get our predictions. Again, passing in the session, the network, the inputs again since they're checking with the training this is the training the placeholder for x and because we're checking the optimized versions we're passing in that y optimizer placeholder from before and now lastly there's a convenient function to evaluate the results so you're going to use that tf utilities dot evaluation passing in the training outputs versus the actual predictions and the interesting thing here is that results actually requests you to put in the number of classes, which isn't too bad. You just put in two. And the really cool thing about this is that results will automatically, sorry, the results in this case, once you run the evaluation function, conveniently enough, gives you a confusion matrix. It gives you the X1 score in two different capacities and the accuracy score conveniently printed out. You don't have to do anything specific like getting the accuracy, getting the confusion matrix like you would with like scikit-learn evaluation the evaluation sorry the evaluation function automatically gives you that which is really cool to conclude this tutorial we're gonna take a test data set and apply it to our classifier that we trained so we're gonna upload our test data check to see if we need to label the columns turns out we do so we're gonna take our columns that we made prior apply them to this data set use our function that we made before to remove the categorical columns and get our new test data set without them, split our data into input outputs, apply the min-max scaler to transform our input data, use our label binarizer to transform our output values, and also flatten them so that we again get that single array. Check to see the counts on the output values. Again, these are unbalanced. And just go ahead and look at the shape of the outputs. From there, like we did before, we're gonna run our prediction. So wide test is gonna be our predict function, Again, inputting the session, the network we're using, the test inputs, and again, our placeholders, X and Y opt. And again, to get our results of those predictions, again, use the evaluation function applied to the test outputs, the test predictions, and again, saying the number of classes. And again, just like before, we get this convenient confusion matrix, our F1 scores, and an accuracy score. Sorry, accuracy score, my bad. So the last couple of things. One, we want to save these parameters so that this way we can reuse this network and or improve on it. So we're going to use save npz dictionary. So this will save the parameters as a dictionary npz file 
There are other options in TensorFlow, but this is the most straightforward, I thought. And so what you're going to upload, or sorry, pass in as far as parameters, is the training parameters, which we predefined before. Give a name to the file and the session. And I'll let you know if the model saved efficiently or not. From there, again, because we did an interactive session, we have to, of course, manually close the session. Do not forget to do this. And that concludes our tutorial. So thanks for sticking along with me for this. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, so from practice exercises, uh, again, try to take a data set of your own, whether it has binary outputs or more than two outputs, and build your own artificial neural network with TensorLayer. Be sure to read through the other examples because the examples and documentation for TensorLayer as a whole is very well documented. So take advantage of that and try even just try to use those examples and build a different network of your choice, whether it's like a convolutional neural network, an RNN, um, a bidirectional RNN, anything of the sort. So in summary, TensorLayer again is an easier means to either use in place of TensorFlow and or to transition into it. And now you have at least an example of an artificial neural network that can be built with TensorLayer. So you have a blueprint of how you can build your own and a bit of feature engineering to go along with that. Thanks again for watching this video and or if you read through this tutorial, please let me know what you thought in the comments below or simply by liking the video and don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you next time.